Great. Uh, thank you for that, uh, for that setup, uh, Eric. Um, I'm going to be talking about something a little different right now. Uh, to this point, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about the extent to which neuroscience might be relevant for defendants. Obviously, there are civil applications, and we'll be hearing uh, even more uh, about those uh, in a bit. But I want to talk about decision making not by defendants, but by judges and jurors. And there are two areas in which that overlaps with law and neuroscience. One is, of course, how judges and jurors understand neuroscientific evidence. Uh, and that's an important area, and we're doing some uh, work in there, and there have been some important uh, publications in that area as well. What I want to do now is to just to give a sense of um, the breadth of overlap in law and neuroscience. I'm going to be talking about using neuroscientific techniques to try to understand something more about how we go about making punishment decisions. So this all started uh, when I and, and a, a colleague, Rene Marois, at uh, Vanderbilt uh, were exploring the possibility of using neuroscientific techniques, and we started with this uh, question uh, straight out of Dostoevsky. Uh, basically, uh, he didn't put it quite this way, but how does the brain decide whether or not to punish someone, and if so, how much? So that was our question, and the, the exploration was going to be whether or not uh, neuroscience could help us. We ultimately put together a large interdisciplinary team, not only uh, Rene, but added uh, Josh Buckholz, now at Harvard, David Zald, uh, John Gore, and a number of others, uh, in pursuit of this topic, the neural correlates of third-party punishment. And this is the experiment I'm going to be talking about today. And I hasten to add here at the beginning, we've heard from uh, Jeff Aguirre and, uh, and BJ, I'm sure we'll hear from Liz as well, that these experiments, as, uh, as valuable as they are, are investigating a highly complex organ about which there is still much to learn. So what we report out of this particular experiment is preliminary, uh, it's exploratory, we hope it's moving in the direction, but theoretically it could be wrong. And I think that's uh, just some uh, admission we need to make right at the outset. Okay, so what we wanted to do was uh, use this technique. Jeff gave a, a nice overview of it this morning, an MRI scanner, and we wanted to use it uh, scanning people during functional tasks. And here's the basic setup of the experiment, uh, just the highlights. We took subjects and we gave them each 50 scenarios. We had a larger battery and we interleaved and randomized the scenarios. 20 of these scenarios were going to involve a perpetrator, John, who was responsible for his behavior in sort of the classical way, and I'll give an example of that in a moment. And then 20 would use uh, diminished responsibility scenarios in which a person, uh, John again, would not necessarily the same John, but would do something that would uh, cause harm, but he would do it either hypnotized or under duress or sleepwalking or hearing demons, you know, this wide variety of circumstances that would be uh, typically diminishing his culpability in the eyes of most citizens. And then we had some control conditions. And I'm going to give examples of each of these scenarios in a minute so that you can dial, dial that in. And the idea here is that we would do a basic subtraction technique. We would uh, accumulate the responsibility condition, uh, brain responses, and also the diminished responsibility uh, conditions, and subtracting those uh, one from the other, see what was left over, and in theory, that should help us identify brain regions uh, that were doing some of the work differently between these two different conditions, so focusing on responsibility. Um, we also were asking them, we were collecting behaviorally their punishment choice for John in each of these scenarios. So they would read the scenario and a answer, how much punishment do you think John deserves on a scale from zero to nine, where zero is no punishment and nine is extreme punishment. We had to subjectivize this, of course, because people's maximum punishment might vary quite considerably uh, between those who would never give more than 20 years for anything and others who might give uh, uh, electrocution for jaywalking. So this uh, enables us to, uh, to, to get a spread on which we could compare people. And we also collected arousal data as, as well. Okay, so responsibility condition. John is a bad guy. He does a bad thing for a bad reason. Okay, so your upper left here is, uh, is your, your classic uh, sort of criminal. Diminished responsibility. John uh, robs a house, but he does so because a drug dealer uh, puts a gun in his face and says, if you don't rob this house, uh, I'm going to shoot you. We might still hold 
such a fellow responsible, but not in the same way as the first fellow. So here are three scenarios. So responsibility question. One night John is bored, he approaches a neighbor's home while she is away, vandalizes the house and yard. He breaks windows, uh, he knocks over a grill, he throws a bicycle in the pool, and then just to add a little more, uh, we had John uh, break a child's swing set before he walks away. Okay, so that bad John. Um, so uh, now no subject would get this matching question. This would go to different subjects. But notice this is a diminished responsibility question in which John is doing very much the same harm but in a very different state of mind. So he's at a party and unbeknownst to him somebody slips him a drug. He starts hallucinating wildly. He does the same sorts of things. He breaks windows. He knocks over the grill. He throws the bicycle in the pool. He breaks the child's swing set. And the next day he has no recollection of this whatsoever. So control question, just to make sure we're uh, uh, establishing a baseline here. Uh, ask yourselves whether you've ever done something like this. The manual to your car says the oil must be changed no less frequently than every 4,000 miles, but you knowingly drive 4,023 before taking it in for service. Uh, you know what the manual says. You violate it uh, purposefully. Uh, and in this case, John does the same thing. How much do we punish him? Typically, the answer would be zero. Uh, but you'll see that if you look at this, uh, at this screen, just focusing on the far right for a moment, you'll notice that the no crime scenarios are not quite at zero in the punishment uh, bar. This is, these are the blue bars, okay? Now this is fair notice to all of you. It turns out, it turns out that our subjects were really, really uh, punitively engaged when you leave your house plans to die when you go on vacation. So don't do this, okay? They thought you should be punished for this sort of behavior. But as you'll see, the punishment in the no crime condition, very, very low, like the arousal. But what I want to draw your attention to is between the first set of bars, which is responsibility, and the second set of bars, diminished responsibility, you'll notice some drop off in the height of the red bars, okay? So the arousal is somewhat less when the state of mind is less purposeful. But the big thing here that we wanted to go after is notice how much the blue bar drops. Okay, between the first blue bar and the second blue bar, you see very, very large drop off in the average punishment people are giving. And so what we wanted to figure out in part was what's going on in the brain to the best we can approximate it using fMRI. Uh, and to just jump ahead to, uh, to our, our findings from this particular study, uh, we found that if you subtracted the, re the diminished responsibility brain activity from the responsibility activity, uh, you were drawn to, not, not surprisingly, this was an area of, of some interest to us, uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, uh, which is activated more, that is the, the proxies we use for oxygen consumption among the neurons uh, suggest that the neurons are working more in the responsibility condition than in, than in the diminished responsibility condition. But what's interesting about this is there was not a very clear correlation within punishment scenarios um, uh, of the amount of activity of the brain in that region and the actual punishment that somebody chose. Obviously, they were punishing responsible agents more than less responsible agents, but the amount that they were punishing didn't seem to correlate with the activity there uh, as strongly as one uh, might, uh, might otherwise think. So this is a graph that, uh, uh, a chart that shows, if you watch the, the red line here, uh, you'll see that the responsibility conditions uh, activated uh, more than the diminished responsibility, which is the, um, the green line. And I want to draw your attention, because I'll come back to it in a few minutes, the time period uh, on the x-axis between roughly five seconds and 16 seconds. You'll notice there's a dip there before the, uh, the activity. It's not uncommon to have a dip, but I want to come back in a few minutes to what else is going on in the brain during that same period. Okay, so what does seem to be correlating, not necessarily causing, but correlating with the punishment amounts? We know what people are giving. So uh, it turns out that uh, in our experiment, we were able to identify that the right amygdala which is involved in affective circuitry, which is involved uh, in, among other things, uh, Liz is an expert in the amygdala, uh, but it's uh, uh, considered to be uh, involved in arousal and emotional reactions. Uh, roughly speaking, 
activity there correlated positively with the amount of punishment that people were choosing to give John in each scenario. Now, uh, I hasten to add, again, this is a correlating uh, activity. It could be that having seen what punishment you just gave, you react and your amygdala is uh, activated in the, uh, what we're tracing here. Or it could be that the causal arrow runs the other direction, or it could be that it co-varies for, uh, for some other reason. Um, so uh, what I want to do is mention what our initial findings were here and then complicate them. So initially, this might suggest that you've got two different neural systems involved. We're combining here, as, as the lawyers know, uh, both the functions of the jurors to, uh, to decide to punish and the function of the judge to decide how much to punish. It's an exploratory project. We combined them in this particular uh, task. But you'll notice that you could, if you'll forgive me the overly suggestive coloring here, you've got sort of a cool, deliberative, analytical prefrontal cortex uh, activity that correlates more with the decision whether or not the agent is responsible. And you've got, again, very roughly speaking, a, a hotter, more emotional reaction that codes potentially with the amount of harm in the scenario and that somehow out of these two regions in some complex way yet to be discovered, uh, there's a net decision about how much to punish uh, John. Okay. So the caveat here is that there are other things going on in the brain than just what's happening in these two regions. So for example, to bring your attention back to these uh, few seconds here, I want to show what's going on in an area called the temporoparietal junction. Uh, you can see in coronal section here, activation uh, above the ears essentially on both sides of the brain. And what's interesting here is that the activation, if you look at the, at the um, the green line for diminished responsibility, you see something of an inverse compared to the prefrontal cortex. That is, the TPJ is activated more in the diminished responsibility condition of John than in the responsibility condition of John. Now, what's interesting is if I add in to this next screen, if I overlay uh, uh, adjacently here, actually, the, uh, the screen I showed you earlier of what's happening in the DLPFC, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, if you look at the time when the DLPFC is deactivated before it starts ramping up to peak, this is precisely the period at which the TPJ in time course has already started ramping up. Now this suggests, and it's just a hypothesis, but it suggests that perhaps the TPJ is engaged in an antecedent assessment of blameworthiness and that it integrates with information from the amygdala and the DLPFC in a way to uh, to, uh, to generate the, the actual choice. Again, this is exploratory and, and conjectural. Um, but the TPJ, some studies have suggested, are uh, the bilaterally involved in perspective taking. Uh, this is not uncontroversial, but one interpretation of this region's activity is that uh, you're putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, if you'll allow me the, the shorthand there. Uh, to see if I had been in that situation, what I would have intended. Maybe he's not intending his behavior in the same way uh, that, uh, that a, a, a truly responsible agent would. Um, my colleague uh, Renee and Josh Buchholz uh, mentioned earlier have a paper out in which they lay out some, uh, some hypotheses about the complexity of this, suggesting that maybe the TPJ, that is the temporoparietal junction, is involved in, in assessing the intent first and that it and the amygdala feed through the medial uh, prefrontal uh, cortex in a way that integrates information and that the DLPFC may be sort of last stop on the train in making the choice. Is it, you know, where between zero and nine uh, would I punish this guy? So we're trying to use this as a basis for exploring further to try to understand the mechanisms uh, by which this operates. Now, one technique Jeff, in his wonderful survey this morning, didn't get a chance to talk about, because it's not really an imaging technique, but it is a neuroscientific technique, is uh, RTMS, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. And this is a technique sometimes used to get more at the uh, causal than merely uh, correlative uh, 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 activity and, and its meaning uh, in the brain. And so what we have underway is an RTMS study 
to disrupt the activity of the DLPFC in a way that's, that would suggest, if it is causally related in this punishment chain, should result in behavioral changes downstream. Uh, if it doesn't, then maybe it's not involved causally in the way that we think it might be. And the way this operates is basically to take advantage of the relationship Jeff mentioned between magnetism and electricity, um, but in roughly the opposite direction. So instead of reading out the electrical, uh, the, the, the magnetic activities uh, related to uh, oxygenated hemoglobin in an MRI, you take a magnetic pulse and you pulse it at the brain in such a way that you can disrupt uh, the neural activity that would otherwise uh, be happening in the brain. Now this, uh, like uh, Jeff mentioned earlier, so far as we know, this is a safe technique uh, and uh, reversible. It appears to last for about 20 minutes or so after, uh, after a period of, of activation. And it cannot reach very deeply into the brain. So you can't use this technique to go after the amygdala, for example, which would be another wonderful uh, experiment to do if, if we could do it. But we're trying to use uh, these experiments as a basis to explore this. Okay, so that leaves us with the why question. Why are we doing it? And why is this uh, decision-making panel uh, shaped in part the way it is? The long-term goal here is to try to understand enough about how the brain is engaged in this activity to try to combine with behavioral studies and other things we know about judging and assessing uh, intent and deciding how much to punish people and assessing harm in which people have, have been engaged, to try to, to combine these in a, in a convergent way to have a deeper, deeper and uh, richer understanding of how, uh, how brains make these decisions in a way that might improve the fairness and effectiveness of them over time because, and precisely because we know that brains are uh, prone to various kinds of biases of the sort that uh, Liz and others, uh, others explore. So we don't necessarily have a magic wand that will wave at the end of the day and say, aha, we've discovered the racism uh, uh, set of neural components right here that we can now, with uh, various interventions, go in and fix. And now no one will be prejudiced when they're in the jury box. But we do think that this is an exploration of neuroscientific techniques that enables us to get a, a, a broader and richer and uh, more interdisciplinary understanding of where these behaviors come from in a way that might lead us to improving uh, their operation. So, um, so thank you very much. <laughs>